May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I don't know whether you recognize the lyrics from a hymn that many know in the, contained within the collect. Awake, awake to love and work, the lark is in the sky. And the last line is, so let the love of Jesus come and set our soul ablaze. Those are the lyrics of G. Stuart Kennedy, the World War I Irish chaplain to the British Army, for whom we are giving thanks today. Kennedy came to Christ, and in the midst of the crucible of being an army chaplain, seeing the very worst that humanity could do to each other, those of you who remember the poem in Flanders Fields and about the bloodshed that was there in Europe, uh, was radicalized. He expressed his most of his radical political thoughts as well as passion for Jesus in poetry. And you can still find a collection of his poetry now condensed in a book called The Unutterable Beauty. Um, I was given that book of poetry as a 19 year old. And I was a relatively new Christian serving in a summer missions camp in the Philippines, of all places. And someone who gave it to me was, in fact, a Baptist missionary. But, and as I read Kennedy's poems, which I had never, ever seen before in my whole life, um, his ability to unite love for Christ, adoration and sacrament, and the uniting of the love of Christ through the sacrament into the place of human suffering was a combination that I had never seen before. It opened me up in a whole new way uh, to a whole vista of God that I, in fact, never seen. He's kind of a mixed character because there are plenty of people that would wrestle with his radical politics, myself included, by the way. But he, in his own way, did his best through his poetry, through his public speaking, and the like, to try to call the nation of England to a more humane kind of life. And that is for what he is known. Died in 18, not, I'm sorry, 1929. I want to hold him up today because it seems to me his witness is completely consonant with our concept of what we're describing in terms of mission. You see, you don't know, once you say yes to Jesus, and as it were, open your hands, as to how he might use you. Um, and I would encourage you not to think, as it were, in strictly religious categories. Because you see, if God loves the whole world, it may be that he might use you through his wisdom and his guidance and his discretion to make a difference in any kind of field, whether that be business or politics or medicine or law or even making your place, um, your restaurant, a, a place for giving people a second chance in business, serving a quality product and genuinely expressing care and hospitality in what you do in your restaurant. That's actually John Rivers' testimony and his chain of Four Rivers Barbecue. It, you see, the whole earth is God's. Mm -hmm. And he actually cares about all of it. And so to reach forth your hands is to say to God, you're the Lord of the whole earth. What would you have me do? And be, I think, both delighted and surprised by what it is that he asks of you. How he shapes the good part of your heritage to form you into the kind of person that he called and ordained for before the foundations of the world. Because regardless of your lineage, you're not an accident. No matter what your parents might have told you. <laughs> um, you. You are here by God's purpose and design to serve him. Use doing the work of culling through your life to find the threads that God has pulled together to form you into the kind of person that he is making you both learning how to renounce the wickedness of your heritage, but also 
partaking of the good, that out of that God might use you in a very unique way, in a way that he may not use anybody else. There are people you know. There are places where you visit. There are friendships that you have that are not duplicated by any other human being. And it's exactly in those places where God wants to use you. I mean, we, we have this really funny idea uh, that I think is quite detrimental. That somehow, if I'm really going to be used by God, that means I must have to wind up eventually wearing one of these. <laughs> and if I'm really called of God into, into ministry, that means it's always this kind of ministry. And I, that's an entirely false view. I mean, that is an entirely false view, not from God. It's clericalism that I want nothing to do with. Because the fact of the matter is, people who wear these have a very specific responsibility to, as it says in Ephesians, equip who? The saints for the work of ministry. So that in essence, our congregations become, as I said earlier, <coughs> source churches that strengthens, equips, and trains. So that my hope would be is that you might find ways in my, okay, how do I wrestle with what it means to be a Christian in my field? Whatever that might be. Who's writing on that? Who's talking about that? How can I get with somebody who, say for example, if I'm in the medical profession, that can really help me wrestle with the bioethical questions that are facing Christians and others within that field? If I'm in the field of business, what does it mean to be a part of a business that actually replenishes and serves rather than just continues to take? How do we think about the very live, live question of income inequality? And what do we do about that? See, Christians, in my mind, ought to be out there wrestling with those things. Mm -hmm. That's what it means, it seems to me, to be light of the world, city set on a hill, salt of the earth. And that means we need to know about those things. In the place where God has put us, not all of us will know those things, nor should we. There is this kind of Western fascination with the accumulation of knowledge that in some ways actually can be detrimental to being engaged in ministry. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, we can drive ourselves crazy, staying current about every single thing that's going on. But there are those who actually are called to really know what's going on and to be able to speak to it in a very specific kind of way. Or to use the gifts that God has given you in a way that reflects the very care of Christ. That's Laurelie and I in hospitality. Um, I'm glad that God likes the fact that we love to cook. And so all kinds of people come through our house. It's one of the ways that we express what God is doing. Is what is, how does God want to express himself through you? So please don't imagine that somehow if God is calling you into a new life where you're learning how to stretch forth your hands, the limitation of his call has to do with church work. That's really my point. That's not it. For some, that will be it. But not for most. For most, it will actually be an effective, learning how to be an effective witness in the in-the-world venue where God has put you. That's Kennedy, you see. He's not known for his church ministry. In fact, he probably was not a very good church. Instead, he was always out on the front line addressing the issues of the day bringing his great Christian faith to bear. And I applaud him for that. So, that's why the hymn begins describing the world. Awake to wake to love and work. The lark is in the sky. The fields are wet with dying and dew. He's describing creation, you see. God's plain for that we might be available for his business as those whose heart has been set ablaze with the love of Jesus. That gives us all of the courage that we need to be those who are continuing to learn how to open their hands and see where Jesus will lead them. Amen. Amen.